If you'd like to see more content like this, please support the channel by subscribing and clicking the notification bell. If you find this video insightful and beneficial, please support the YouTube algorithm to spread it by liking, commenting, and sharing. Thank you. Hey everybody, today we're debating whether or not there is good evidence for God and we are starting right now with Abdullah's opening statement. Thanks so much Abdullah for being with us. The floor is all yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi salihin. I'd like to thank both uh, Modern Day Debates, the, the host and Matt Dillahunty for facilitating this discussion. I hope it proves an enlightening one to all concerned. So uh, let's get right into it. So is there good evidence for God? Well, before we proceed, this requires us to define evidence, uh, good evidence, and of course, God. Evidence is simply that effect which indicates a cause behind itself. Uh, we see a tree with a carving and message, and we'd, we'd view that as evidence for something producing the carving. But what makes a good evidence? Well, this can only be understood when we consider that many effects have multiple causes for them. A good evidence for something, I should think, is evidence which points to one particular cause as the most likely or only possibility. In that case, then it will reach the level of absolute proof. Okay, but then what do we mean by God? Well, let's go with a very minimal definition. Uh, by God, we mean something that is a necessary or first existence behind reality, which basically means that it has always existed. Something that is independent in existence, uh, it doesn't depend on anything else more external or, ex or more fundamental than itself to exist. Um, it can create and e exert power to bring new existence to reality and sustain it. And lastly, it chooses to do so, and because it chooses, it has intention and will. So that will be the definition of God I'm going to be going off today. So good evidence for God would need to look like um, such observations of reality that indicate the existence of something that possesses those attributes, namely requiring a cause and positing God as the most likely cause, um, or as the only possible cause. So let's get started with the observation of two of the most fundamental observations of existence, extension and change, or space and time. So let's start with space and time. I also want to, to make a mention that in order to go through the various options, we have to use the, we have to negate contradictions and use the law of the excluded middle in logic. So P and not P can't be, can't be true, but P or not P obviously can be um, valid. So let's start with space or spatial extension. We believe there is existence uh, ascertained by observation or observing something. So that's clearly existence exists. Existence can be of obviously two kinds, dependent, or independent. Reality cannot consist of only dependent existences, things that depend on something else in reality to provide them with existence. This is because it imagines, if you were to imagine this, if you have a poor person who needs one pound to buy a sandwich, but has no money, and then they ask not a poor person who also has no money and so on and so on forth. Even if they were to ask an infinite number of poor people who are all dependent, uh, who all have no money, no money would be produced or passed between them. The problem with infinite regress is it never completes and so is never sufficient. Therefore, a reality based upon infinite regress will always be insufficient. Therefore, there must exist an independent existence uh, somewhere. Any part, anything that is composed of parts depends on those parts to exist. So this is like how if you look at a sandcastle, it's simply a form that depends on the existence of sand to emerge as a form from. Basically, form is an arrangement of things. Forms are incidental and dependent. So, so forms don't really exist by themselves without their parts or substances. And so we can say forms are dependent by definition. Anything that is extended in space, likewise, depends on a composite of spatial divisions to exist. As Zeno's paradox is noted, anything with size, shape, length, or basically extension also depends on um, in, uh, divisions to exist. Of course, the problem with this is anything extended in space is always divisible and therefore dependent, and so must be dependent and cannot be independent. Therefore, independent existence cannot be divisible and doesn't depend on extension in space to exist. Extended existence can't be produced by a composite of adding together um, uh, independent existences of no extension. For example, so if something is indivisible, it can't have extension. So zero length plus zero length plus zero length forever never gets to any length at all. Zero plus zero plus zero always equals zero, even if you have infinite zeros. So the independent existence is therefore separate 
from extended existence. Extended existence being dependent must therefore rely on independent existence to extend it into existence from nothing, aka created. If independent existence is indivisible, it cannot be separated or divided into multiples and therefore there can only be one independent existence. All extended things in reality depend on one independent existence to exist, therefore. If independent existence is indivisible, then there is nothing more fundamental than it. But if there's nothing more fundamental than it, then it produces extended existence without compulsion from another more fundamental or external source, like an automatic gears inside itself or what have you, which it doesn't have. And so the only possibility left is that it chooses to create. Intention is defined as unnecessary choice, non-compelled by prior or more fundamental courses, uh, causes as concerning a, a choice or decision. So that's intention is, as we previously defined, um, is something which is unnecessary choice. If it is uncaused independent existence and creates with intention, this meets the definition of God previously iterated. Let's go into time, if I have the time. Now, there is existence, of course, we start with the same thing. Um, from uh, from nothing, nothing comes. And so there must always have been uh, existence. Uh, you could either call it necessary existence or first existence. However, there is change. We can ascertain that by existence. Change is defined as an arrangement of form or extension of things that depends on a prior extension or arrangement of things, or it could be a new arrangement or form or extension of things created by something prior that has no arrangement or extension, i.e. arrangement extension pops out of nothing. <clears throat> arrangement um, arrangement uh, for arrangement de depends on its, uh, unfortunately, uh, like in space, arrangement depends on its constituent members to move and therefore arrangement is static by itself and still dependent on its constituent members. Because if you look at that, there has to be a first existence. You can't have an existence um, that you can't have infinite regress of dependent things. So there must be a first existence. Either this first existence is an arrangement or extension itself, or it's something that doesn't depend on arrangement extension itself. But if it has arrangement, it, as we mentioned before, or extension or size, it's divisible and it's still dependent on smaller members. The first existence cannot depend on arrangement, form, or extension, because if it is the first existence, it must precede arrangement and extension, because the first, as we've mentioned, first existence can't have arrangement or extension. So because it doesn't depend on it, it must precede it. The first change uh, that was created, therefore, uh, the first the definition of the first change was that it was the creating of new extension from nothing, from, from where there was no extension, there is now extension. The first existence being the first cause therefore precludes any prior external or internal causes to it. But if that's the case, if there was nothing prior to the first cause, causing creation, it can only create without compulsion, without necessity, and this is only can be explained by choice. Again, intention is defined as unnecessary choice, non-compelled prior to any, uh, not, it's not doesn't have any comp compulsion of anything prior to it. And if it is uncaused and it creates with intention, this meets the definition of God. So in conclusion, I've demonstrated that the evidence of space and time itself ineluctably and unavoidably necessarily, necessarily indicates the existence of God as the only possible cause for them without falling into contradictions. This is because observable reality is insufficient to be all that exists and still explain itself. It fundamentally depends on God with the attributes I described as we just saw necessitated by the effect God causes. God creates time and change and actively sustains space and time. The argument I presented, while the form of it is my own, I took from the Quran's own arguments, urging mankind to reflect upon the cause of and behind all things. God says in the Quran, surely in the creations of the heavens and the earth, space and time, or sorry, space and extension, and the alternation of night and day, change in time, these are signs for people who reason. And also in the Quran, God says, with power we did construct the heaven, and verily we are able to extend the vastness of space thereof. Once again, I thank you to the host for giving me the space and time on your platform, of which I depended upon, to present this argument. So thanks again.
Thank you very much for that opening statement, Abdullah. And with that, we are going to kick it over to Matt for his opening statement as well. In the meantime, want to say thanks so much for being with us, folks. If it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral channel hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. We hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from. And also want to let you know, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as we have many more juicy debates coming up. You don't want to miss it. And so with that, thanks so much for being with us. Matt, the floor is all yours for your opening as well. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, happy to be here. Appreciate you, James and uh, Abdullah, for doing this. Is there good evidence for God? This is a topic that we've debated many, many times. And um, you know, I, in my notes right off the bat, I was... I had down, well, which God are we talking about? What are the correct characteristics of this? And most importantly, how do you know that those are, in fact, the characteristics of God? Because what we'll often see is, here's a question, and we'll infer a bunch of things about it, and then we'll just say, oh, that's consistent with the nature of God or, or how we've defined God. But you haven't demonstrated, um, usually, that the thing you're pointing to is something that does exist, can exist, is possible to exist, et cetera. It's just an inference uh, at best. And the question that we're trying to address is, is there good evidence? And for me, when we talk about whether or not there's good evidence, it's whether or not the evidence is sufficient to warrant reaching a particular conclusion. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not going to be compelled by testimony or stories and even philosophical arguments that don't strongly tie to physical evidence uh, aren't necessarily going to be compelling about things that we don't have the ability to investigate. Certainly not uh, good enough evidence to dedicate one's life to something or say that you have, in fact, reached a conclusion about what must necessarily be uh, or probably be the cause of everything. Now, testimony is, of course, fine for mundane, unremarkable things, but not for supernatural claims. And physical arguments um, about the nature of the universe are great for talking about the nature of the universe, but they don't tell us uh, very much at all if anything at all, about things that are outside the universe or whether outside the universe is even a uh, cogent concept. Now, I'm tempted most of the time that I engage on these subjects to say, oh, there's no evidence for the existence of God. But when I do that, of course, somebody comes along and says, well, there's testimonial evidence. It's, it's anecdotal. And there's these other things that are consistent with a particular God proposition. And so, you know, it's, it's wrong of you to say there's no evidence. And that's correct. But the evidence isn't worth that much. And so when we argue about good evidence, uh, there are other similar questions where we would just say there isn't evidence for this. Like I, I would say there isn't evidence for Bigfoot. All right, fine. There isn't good evidence for Bigfoot because they, you know, there's a film clip and a footprint and some testimonials in the film clip, you know, while it was faked, is still stronger than what we actually have for God. The UFO footage is even the Cottingley Ferry pictures um, is still at least something we're pointing to where it's like, ah, here is evidence that's consistent with this. Not just evidence that's consistent with the proposition, but that strongly points to one specific conclusion over another. That is where we're talking about good evidence. Basically, when the evidence is this evidence was caused by the fact that the proposition is true, not just that it's consistent with it, but that we can draw a strong connection to it. Um, what people believe or that people believe, neither of them are good evidence. What would the world be like if there was good evidence for God? Well, we wouldn't have multiple religions with such huge followings, I would suspect. Uh, journals would be affirming the one true God that's demonstrated with evidence. And there would still be disagreement, of course, just like there's disagreement about the shape or age of the earth, despite the fact that the best evidence, which is great evidence, trivially confirms that the earth is round and billions of years old. Um, the fact that there can be a debate doesn't mean that there's actually a reasonable debate. If there were good evidence for God, it would be a part of science. It would be a part of the findings about reality. We could debate a flat earth. We could debate the germ theory disease, evolution. We could debate who won the election. The fact that there's a debate doesn't mean that we don't know what the truth is, not individually, perhaps, but collectively. And what qualifies when, when we're going to go and teach something in, let's say, public school science class or a public school history class, we don't teach the Bible or the Quran as science or history because they don't qualify. They're historic-ish with a side of magic. There's no Nobel Prize for religion. It just, the subject itself has not risen to the level where there's sufficient good evidence 
to put it into those categories. It becomes a matter of personal convincement. And it's not just that we can argue for the best evidence currently available, you know, citing our limitations of exploration, because once upon a time, the best evidence currently available suggested that the sun orbited the earth. That was a perfectly reasonable conclusion given direct observations. And yet we know that the exact opposite is true. And that wasn't something that we could reasonably infer given that smaller limited set of pool of information. That evidence, which was once good, is now known to be insufficient. In short, we just can't go by how it looks. So you gather available facts for the thing that you're trying to explain. And you look for the explanation that best fits all of the available facts and doesn't permit multiple explanations of similar but competing explanations. Put together a jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes there's two pieces that might look like they fit, but don't. Uh, it fits on one edge versus four. It's just a little bit off with a little gap. And you made a reasonable inference based on the limited information you had. But when the whole puzzle is put together, with the exception of that one piece, uh, things are more clear. What do we mean by? evidence. Now, obviously, we're talking about the collection of facts associated with a situation or a proposition or a question, which must then be evaluated or accounted for in determining whether or not an explanation is true. You make a list then of all the things that Abdullah and I believe. There are things that hopefully, I think we both believe, and maybe we have good evidence for those things. But list the things that we don't both accept, and that's where we can really begin to compare how we're going to go about evaluating the available evidence to support our proposed explanations for the universe or whatever it is we disagree on. And good evidence is not merely an opinion. You can think flipping a coin is good evidence, but I'd argue you'd be wrong. And I'd hope that we agree on that. Yet people think there's good evidence. They think, they think there's good evidence for astrology. They think there's good evidence for psychics. They think there's good evidence for demons and lucky socks and coin tosses. How people feel about it is a vote uh, for the best way, is that a vote for the best way to figure out the truth? Because we're not all going to sit down and vote on whether the earth is flat. That's not how we go about getting to the truth. Good evidence is able to be replicated. It's distinct. It leads to one explanation and not multiples with similar support. And then better evidence uh, is when you, tar when you have investigated this more thoroughly and you have physical evidence that's independently verified, et cetera. But the evidence that we have for God, a good chunk of it is anecdotal in testimonial sense, or unverifiable, or speculative, or in conflict with other beliefs that better attest to the facts of the universe. It's not good evidence. If it were good, the world would look very, very different. If we're going to make inferences, we can't just say, ah, well, we all know that something can't come from nothing. Do we? What does that even mean? And what what, is there a proposition, in fact, that something has, in fact, come from nothing? Oh, well, there can't be an infinite regress. Can't there be? What, what does that even mean? It's only a regress at all because of our position trying to look back at it. That doesn't tell us anything at all about what actually happened. And so when you have philosophical speculation, even as much as of, of a fan of philosophy as I am, that is an attempt to explain the things that we don't yet have enough information for. What happened prior to the Big Bang? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know, have any way of knowing. And I'm not even convinced that we can know beyond, you know, know to a strong degree of confidence that the Big Bang cosmology is correct. It's the current best explanation of the available facts. It fits the data. And we're continuing to explore. But this is a realm for science to investigate. And we may be forever blocked. And this is the curious thing for me, is that once upon a time when you asked people for good evidence uh, for the existence of God, you would get testimony. And then you'd get various arguments, some of which are fallacious, some of which aren't, or at least uh, the form is valid. So there's not a structural problem with it. But when you get down to the point where you say, ah, let me make this pronouncement about one of the biggest questions ever. Let's make a pronouncement about what is the explanation for why there's something rather than nothing? And you start rattling off the characteristics of the thing that you think is responsible for something rather than nothing. You've got a whole lot of work to do to explain there, not just go around and say, see, 
here's something about reality and that's explained by this. And here's something about reality and that's explained by this because we don't explain things in terms of unknowns. We don't explain things in terms of unproven things. We tend to explain things in terms of what we know because those things have explanatory power. So to say there is a magical being who exists outside of space time, who isn't bound uh, to the laws of physics and has always existed without any sort of uh, philosophical problem. And that is the explanation for the universe. I need evidence that that thing could possibly exist or that it does exist. There's a sound. Thank you very much for that opening, Matt. We're going to kick it over to Abdullah for his four minute rebuttal. Thanks, Abdullah. The floor is all yours. Okay. So, um, unfortunately, oh. Oh, my apologies. That's my phone making noise. I thought that was James telling me my time was up. I'm very sorry about that. It's off now. No worries. All right. So, anyway. Oh, I think you might have muted yourself, Abdullah. Okay. Sorry. So, I want to thank Matt for his response. Unfortunately, I think he hasn't um, addressed anything seriously what I said, and maybe he appears flustered by my slides, um, bombarding of slides. But in essence, the issue I've, I've argued, and I think he misrepresented what I was even saying, or, or the very point of my argumentation. Um, I came with a definition of God because one of the contentions would be that if, if you don't know what, if you don't uh, you not define God, then you you can put him anywhere, right? So. I came up with a very specific um, definition, which basically includes intentionality, which is something that a physicalist or a materialist would, just, would clearly not um, accept as part of the, um, existence, or they'd say that we don't have any evidence for that. However, here's the issue, was that what I argued was that the universe or extended reality itself, so anything that has spatial extension or depends on spatial extension, is insufficient to explain itself. You can't have a universe of only forms and no substance because they could be infinitely anything with spatial extension could be infinitely divided um forever and then the, the, what's it made out of then it, it, if it could be infinitely divided as an infinite regress of further and further divisions um and there and no substance um ultimately speaking something that zeno um the greek philosopher the, of the Eleatic, of the Eleatic school picked up uh, and, and made that 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 point that he thought that actually reality observable reality didn't make sense um and therefore he believed it was an illusion uh, the infinite regress problem is it's it's not something that is just um uh, us a problem for us because we're in the chain and we, we don't understand it um it's a contradiction in terms if i was to say that uh, this debate won't be able to finish until an infinite amount of time has passed or uh, matt won't be able to speak until uh, i've given an infinitely long speech matt will never be able to speak and this event will never be able to end uh, so clearly Infinite regress with things that begin and uh, end, so it's basically a contradiction because what infinite regress is saying is it's saying that there is an uncompletable amount of things that are that complete. It's a contradiction in terms, which is why it's a problem which he has to address, which is um, ultimately speaking, what is the beginning of, of everything and what caused that beginning. Now, I discussed the possibilities using the law of the excluded middle, which is um, is it in, independent or not dependent? Is it extended or not extended? By using that very precise argumentation, I could negate all possibilities that could be there um, other than the ones that don't possess, uh, possess contradiction, whereby the only thing that doesn't possess contradiction is something that is uh, independent, it's necessary, it has always existed, and it initiated change. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not part of an infinite regress, but it initiates change um by choice because there's nothing if there's something behind god that is pushing god to make change and that will then god will be part of an infinite regress there'll be something behind him something behind him something behind him so there has to be this initiation of change it's initiation of creation and if something initiates when it doesn't have to that's the definition of choice and of course choice denotes intentionality and and so on and so forth there's no way around that as much as we'd like to um as much as some materialists would like to there's no way around that uh and also, again, you, you, you might argue that, um, we, that you know, why does the, the universe, or it, which is in something inside, or which we're inside the universe, why do we need to posit anything, um, or why do we need to posit God, or how do we know what's outside the universe? Well, the thing is this, firstly, 
you're putting a boundary on what you mean by the universe. You're saying there's an outside, because technically the universe is everything that exists. So uh, by pure definition, I suppose uh, God would be part of existence um, and therefore be part of quote unquote the universe. But I'm simply putting that you can divide the universe into two parts, one, uh, so to speak, the extended part and non-extended part. Everything that's extended depends on its, its constituent components to exist. And you can't have a universe of only forms. There has to be substance. But you, but any way you pick, anywhere, any time you pick a substance, saying this substance is extended, in, in um, uh, is extended, uh, it can be divided further. So the only way out of that tr that um, bind is to, to deposit that everything that has substance is being sustained by something that doesn't ha depend on extension to exist. You see, so there's but things that depend on extension idea, and things that don't depend on extension. So those are, those are things you have, sure. Those are the things that you actually have to address in my argument. These deficiencies with observable reality uh, if you consider to be closed off from anything outside. We're going to kick it over to Matt for his rebuttal as well. Same amount of time, four minutes. Thanks so much. Matt, the floor is all yours. So I find it interesting that Abdullah used his rebuttal to reiterate what he said and make accusations against me, saying that I haven't addressed what he said and I've misrepresented what he said. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but that was my opening remarks. It was written before I knew what you were going to say. It wasn't my rebuttal. It is, it is ridiculous to criticize my opening remarks for not being a rebuttal. This is the rebuttal time. And this is the point where I actually address what we said. Now, while science is in fact about inferences and we make inferences regularly, science has a limitation in that we don't get to infer supernatural causation. We don't get to infer uh, about things that are beyond our ability to investigate. And inferences to the most likely or most probable explanation would actually be closer to abductive reasoning and while that's fine, it's fine within the context of things that we know within the universe. You don't get to infer to things that you have no way of investigating or exploring. When Abdullah defined God, he didn't specifically uh, claim it was a personal agent, although you may be able to infer that from the notion that it has will and chooses to act. Those may in fact be characteristics that are limited to agents, but he defined God as a necessary, non-contingent or independent uh, thing that can exert power. Well, cool, but I don't see any demonstration that A, that thing exists or that it possibly exists, and that we're talking about temporal connections, temporal uh, actions outside of time, because the current Big Bang cosmology, which is the best explanation we currently have, and I'm open to others if somebody wants to demonstrate that in physics, time began with our universe. You can't our local presentation of time. If you want to talk about meta time or time in a multiverse context or time in a God context, whatever, you have to actually demonstrate how those things work or what the understanding of it is. But A follows B follows C follows, or A leads to B leads to C leads to D. That sort of temporal causation is required for any action. It's impossible for something to exist uh, for zero time because existence is temporal and it's impossible for something to act to cause something in the absence of time. And Abdullah seemed to object to me in my opening, putting a boundary on the universe, but that's exactly what he did when he talked about the observable universe. He put that boundary in place in his opening remarks in order to make claims about something that isn't observable or bound to the universe. And so if you're, if you're going to object to this distinction of let's talk about the universe, the observable universe, um, I'm happy to talk about the observable universe. I just not going to posit a cause and claim that my cause is something that isn't observed or bound by the universe, and yet I still have sufficient reason uh, to warrant it. So the fact that you're convinced or somebody is convinced that there can't be an infinite regress in and of itself doesn't mean that that's the case. But when we're talking about this, we are confusing the time, the space time and causality within the local presentation of the universe and inflating that to say we can make inferences about something that is outside of the local space-time of the universe. I find that to be flawed. I don't know what justification you can use to say that because of facts within the universe, you can infer what it's like outside the universe because I'm not even convinced that outside the universe is a cogent concept. And so if there's a, a God that someone is arguing exists outside of space and time and is the cause and sustainer or however they're going to do it uh, for space and time, you can't just do that by saying, hey, 
there's got to be some explanation. Uh, we can't just have contingent things. There must be something that isn't contingent. Uh, and it, it must be something that chose to act because how did you rule out a multiverse? How did you rule out the notion that the physical laws governing our universe, which may have existed forever, um, aren't such that the local presentation of our universe is in fact a direct uh, unchosen result of those facts that you don't have the ability to investigate. I'm not at all saying you're wrong um, about what you've concluded is the best causal explanation. I'm just saying, I don't see how you can get there from this. It seems to be a lot of, hey, we gotta have an explanation and it must be like this. Therefore, that's kind of like a go. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna kick it into open discussion, folks. And thanks so much for your questions. We're putting them in the list for the Q&A. We've got 60 minutes, the floor is all yours. Matt and Abdullah. Okay, so just to um, make respond. So, because you said that I was, I rambled off some characteristics about um, God and then tried to insert him into um, an explanation of the universe. In your opening statement, I was led to believe that that was your actual, um, uh, you were responding to me. And hence, I, I had evidence to believe had, <laughs> that you actually um, were responding to me. So that's fine. But um, so firstly, just a few corrections. I, I never said contingent at all. I know you used to that kind of uh, wording. I used the word dependent. And I never divided the, the universe um, in, into, um, and it, by saying the universe, there's an observable part to it. Uh, doesn't mean that I've divided it. Like I see an iceberg. I don't say that I've cut the iceberg in two by talking about the observable part of the iceberg and the unobservable part of the iceberg. I'm simply saying that we have to start with what we can observe first to make um, inferences about what we can't observe, which is um, the whole point of, of a, any kind of um, abduction or inference about anything. That we want to make. I, I, I agree with that. Um, are you saying that dependent, dependent, as you're using it, and contingent aren't synonymous? Because it seems to me that you presented versions of arguments that are typically referred to as contingent, and that you just use the language of dependent. Um, isn't that what contingent means? Well, because there are, let's say, um, maybe maybe more than a few ways to understand the word contingent. I use a word that was much more precise, which is simply dependent. So something's existence depends on something else. Or, or something's existence doesn't depend on something else. So th there's only two possibilities. Isn't the law of excluded middle would necessitate that there's only those possibilities. Okay, um, I would I would argue that that's exactly the same as contingent, and and it's all true for contingent. Something's either contingent or it's not contingent. And what we mean when we, we talk about arguments from contingency is this thing is is dependent upon something else being true. But you can use whatever language. I just if you thought there was some significant difference between dependent and contingent, I'm happy well, to address it. I just don't see it. Uh, just clarity. Um, I, I try to be um, clear and precise in the wording to prevent ambiguities. Sure. Um, I, I now, agree then. I agree then that we should start with the observable. Um, so feel free to continue. I just want to make sure we didn't you didn't get twelve points in before I object. No object. problem. So the, the thing is this: um, now everything that we observe, we can't actually know for certain. Um, the the at the specific origin of specific things so for example how do we know we're not bringing the vat in the matrix um uh, being being um we're in a coma we're imagining things we're dreaming things um or the aliens are controlling us and so on and so forth so i took two aspects of reality which are undeniable um uh, because the, ex the experience that we're receiving is in two basic aspects one is extension or space as you might call it and change um, time so these two aspects are, of our observable reality are undeniable and then i asked okay then what uh, what is producing uh, space and time if anything is producing space and time does space and time need to be produced in the first place these were the questions that i asked in my presentation and i used binaries you know you could say or bivalent uh, proposals so either something is independent or dependent uh, so clearly we can't we can't say that the all existence um, suddenly appeared out of nothing. Um, so there was always some existence around um, that created any other things that came about. Whether you want to consider it to be a multiverse or not is irrelevant. But we obviously uh, ex existence there must be some existence somewhere. So we call it ne necessary existence. We have to there has to be a necessary existence somewhere. Now the question is what is the nature of this necessary existence and we just simply ask certain further questions about what necessary existence might entail so clearly we see that change hasn't always been around because if you if the universe was constantly changing forever in the past 
uh, we'd, to get to this point in the present, we'd have to wait for the completion of uh, in infinite regress, which by definition means um, infinity means incomplete. So we're waiting for the completion of an incomplete set um, to be to be exhausted to reach this part of the present. So we can conclude without having to take a time machine that there has to be some beginning somewhere. I, I don't know how how long that is in the past, but there has to be a beginning. So change is not necessary a part of reality. So all I've done is just ask these bivalent proposals and negated the one that produces contradiction and then and left the one that um, doesn't produce contradiction. Um, and when you talked about the multiverse, how do you know that the multiverse didn't create the universe? Well, I already covered that, which is if the, you, let's say for the sake of argument, the multiverse is the first cause behind all things, um, but it has no intentionality, which is what I suppose you're probably going to be leaning towards, um, or you might, you might be something you'd, you'd consider to be a valid um, possibility. So I simply put that if something is not compelled to do things, so the multiverse would be the first cause, there's nothing prior to it, then what causes the multiverse, uh, if it, there is no cause but prior to it, or that's making it do things, to make universes in the first place? So there's a contradiction in, in terms of saying that, well, it just makes things for no reason, because then that means that it, it is, um, uh, it, it is, it, it does things for no reason at all um, so there, there is no cause uh, yeah i don't want to be too short and because i know that these are complex ideas so i want to give you guys enough time but just to keep the conversation sure. conversation going i want to switch it back over to matt pretty quicker sure so first of all i i'm not arguing on behalf of a multiverse i'm pointing out that i haven't seen anybody rule out a multiverse and when we talk about the multiverse you, you're correct that i i don't think the multiverse proposals i won't raise them to the level of models. They're not scientific models that demonstrate the truth of something. The multiverse is a speculation, and it probably will always be a speculation because we don't have the ability to investigate beyond the beginnings of space-time. And so when you ask questions like, well, let's look at the multiverse and say, why isn't this a sufficient explanation for the universe? You, you had asked the question, essentially, why does it do what what it does. Well, how does it, you know, you, the multiverse can't have intentionality if it's not a mind, if it's not a thinking agent, if it's just a some sort of physical process. So how and why does the multiverse do what it does? Well, if we just define multiverse right now as a speculative proposition that uh, there's a meta level, some, some space like thing, it's not our local presentation of space that is producing universes, then to ask the question, why does it do what it does, is a great question that you cannot answer because you have no ability to investigate that. How do you, you physics doesn't necessarily have to work remotely the same there. Um, this thing could have been a multiverse, a multiverse. Yes, I understand that when you look at things um, uh, from our perspective and start going backwards, you could use Zeno's paradox to say, ah, oh, well, if we don't have a T, a clear T zero, then we can't get anywhere because we can always insert intermediate steps. Although I would argue that that's true and, and a problem even for um, any proposed God, uh, because God could potentially do the same thing until at least there's a logical contradiction. Although now I'm talking about a God in a context that doesn't actually fit what Abdullah has defined as God. So I'll back off that. If we're going to take a look at what are potential causes for the universe, and we'll set aside anything about sustaining, but potential causes for the universe, how do we begin to make a list of what is actually a likely cause? And then from that list, determine which are possible and which are probable. Because on that list, I would have to include a speculative multiverse. And on that list, I would have to include some sort of being creating, and I have no way of telling which of those is in fact more probable. And even if I were to come up with a, a, a justification to say, oh, I think this one is slightly more probable, that doesn't mean that we suddenly have good evidence that warrants accepting that this conclusion is true or likely true. And just talking of the propositions that we've made, this one may or may not seem more likely, but I don't, where's the data that shows here, here are the list of candidate explanations and here's why this one is probably correct. Cause I don't see that. 
so let's perhaps agree maybe some um, some basics about what we, what we say good, good evidence. Would you agree that something is really good evidence if we can exclude all other possibilities except one? Sure. All right, excellent. So then let's look at then the possibilities and see if they um, if they the those which are self contradictory and those if see if there's any left after we negate all the ones which are, have contradiction. So let's actually go back to the multiverse and just ask. Forget about it being a speculation. I'm always I'm open to looking at any or, or the, any possibilities out there and seeing what we can deduce about them from um, from their from their claimed natures. So. Uh, so there's something that is making making the universe or making universes. So there's, there's only three possibilities that it has. One is that it's um, undergoing change, so it's moving. Let's just say. Um, so it's it's making universes as part of a, of a continual internal mechanism that it has. Um, but the problem with that is that if it was being propelled to make universes, then there's something prior to it that is compelling it, whether it's an internal mechanism or external. And, and therefore, it would be an infinite regress, uh, which is a contradiction, and therefore that can't be the answer. Um, the second possibility is it's static. It's just absolutely, it's just completely static. But if it is static, then it won't do anything. It can't do anything if it's completely static. So then the only, the only answer that's left is that this multiverse um, can initiate a change, can initiate um, from, a, from doing nothing to doing, doing something. And if it is necessary existence, so it's, it's this multiverse, let's, let's call it the multiverse, is a necessary thing. So as in it's meant to exist and, 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 it, and there's, there's no way it can't exist, um, but it doesn't have to create. Then creation is, uh, because nothing's compelling it to, then creation is um, a choice. And then you might say, well, how do you know this? Well, how do you know why it does what it does? Well, again, let's break down the possibilities because I, I really want to go down the possibilities with you. So uh, one is that it has no intention by what it does. Okay. And the other thing it does, it does have intention behind what it does. There's only those two possibilities. Either there is intention or no intention. There's no, there's no third possibility. It's not half intention or whatever you. So um, if that's the case, if it has no intention or no choice, uh, so between, between its default, which is to do nothing, and then it doing something, which is something that it doesn't have to do, the only, if it doesn't have intention or i.e. choice, uh, then it wouldn't then um, it would be a contradiction because no intention means doing things by nothing for no uh, by no cause whereas intention is doing things because you're caused by uh, by by something now it's not prior cause then the only thing that's left is by choice by um, by the choice of the thing itself so then this multiverse couldn't be a multiverse if you had intention and would then be fall into the definition of what we'd call God by the the presence of intention because if it didn't have intention there's there's no explanation behind the existence of a preference um so it prefers to create uh, um, when it doesn't have to create where does the preference come from no intention says that this preference comes from nothing which again it was a contradiction from nothing nothing comes whereas intention explains that preference comes from intention so it comes from something which is intention that's why um the multiverse I don't need to observe it. I don't need to experience it um, to know that if it is the cause of all things or, or the first cause, it has to have intention. Um, and therefore, it's not the multiverse. It's actually, let's just, let's just use an old fangled word, um, God, if you'd like. Or you can call him Allah, if you'd like. That makes it, <laughs> if you want to use a Semitic word instead of. Um, I'm pretty instead sure of, if um, I did that, I'd, it really irritate some people. Uh, but so, first of all, I. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I understand what you're saying, and yet um, I still have a bunch of problems with it. And that is um, this notion that, well, first of all, you, you said up there's three possibilities, either it's undergoing change or it's static or it's necessary. Um, well, it initiates or it initiates. So it, it can initiate actions. So either it's moving. So you're saying that something, so well, no, no, no. So are you saying that something undergoing change can't initiate action? Um, no, I mean the the reason for its initiating of of action is because it's undergoing change itself. So it's part of a causal process, is what I'm saying. So yeah, it initiates change, of course, because of its internal mechanisms, which are constantly moving. So I'm wondering if you're familiar with Conway's Game of Life. Go ahead. It's a it's a computer program, 
that has very simple rules that uh, generates things that seem uh, to be living, even though we know they're not. This is a computer thing. But one of the things that that it can eventually spontaneously generate is a generator. And so with nothing but incredibly simplistic rules about uh, whether bits are turned on or off, it can, the, the simple algorithm with no choice, no decision, um, can create things that create other things and some that create other things forever. And so with, with an understanding of that sort of thing, and without going into whether or not this leads to um, other issues about a mind, there's clearly no intention in the game of life. And yet here's something that for the, from the standpoint of any of the individuals that it creates, if we were to make those things sentient, they could look back and say, look, I came from a generator, which generated me. And where did the generator come from? Well, it could be generated by this generator. Well, where did that come from? Clearly there can't be an infinite regress, but I don't see that that's actually true. And well, even if there couldn't be an infinite regress, it could be that here's the multiverse, which serves as a generator for universes. And then the process by which a multiverse comes into being, if, if we need to make that assumption, could be something else entirely that we won't know and can't know until we investigate it. It seems to me that all of these inferences are based on here are the facts of the reality that we investigate. Let's expand those facts out to a realm um, which we can't even demonstrate as a realm, which may not follow those same rules. Okay, I actually like that example you you bring. It's actually a very good example. I, I'm actually conf confused why you'd bring it up because um, it actually would support my argument um, and my my whole entire position. So you have a program. What's the program running on? The program's running on a computer, but that's not relevant okay. to the analogy. Oh, but Oh, but it's extremely relevant. Because no, it's not. No, it's not. And I can demonstrate this really easily where okay. we've gotten confused. The question here is, do we have, um, do we have good reason? If I may, to... if I may, right? I, um, no, I'm... What, what, what is a program? What is a program? It doesn't matter. It does, because you brought it, that... It you doesn't. If you let me finish, I could stop this waste of time from happening. Well, uh, the no, question uh, here is not whether or not there so, is a God. It's whether or not we have good reason to conclude that there's a God. And from the, from the viewpoint of the things that are generated in the game of life, they do not and could not have good reason to conclude that there is a creator. Their perspective is that they were generated and they don't have an explanation for how that generator, because the generator that generated them could also be the result of an algorithm that they cannot investigate. So yes, th this analogy is going to break down like everything else does, because yes, it runs on a computer and it's a program and the program was originally written by a person, but that's not anything that the individuals that are created in the game of life can reasonably conclude. That okay, so if I, if I may be allowed to speak and respond, right? So, that, um, so if you look at the, these, let's say in the program itself, okay, even if the issue was that, let's forget about the process and forget about it was a written program, what what you could conclude if you were let's say somehow in that program was that the the the, the program had a start point because each point in each moment in time or in that program was preceded by a previous moment in time and there can't be an infinite regress so there was a beginning to the program and then the question is what initiates the program itself what initiates the algorithms uh, where do the algorithms come from it would always be um there would be, there'd be one let's say atheist um, pr um sprite inside the program that would say uh, the program's always been around and there would be, let's say, a not so atheist sprite. I'd say, you know what, maybe this program, I actually think the only possible explanation is this program was initiated uh, by by something and let's call it the programmer. And everything that we see arising in this program, as amazing as it might be, had a start point by something that initiated, wrote a program and, and put it on, a, on some, on, run it on a processor when it didn't have to. And hence, choice and hence we, it wouldn't be a, a a blind robot that just makes programs ad infinitum going back in the past but it would be the the origin of a programmer could be inferred by a sprite a, a rational theist sprite within 
within the program to take the analogy forward. So that's why I was really confused with the analogy because the analogy is a perfect example of the point I'm saying is that two sprites stuck in a program could still make re, um, very ra- sound conclusions about ultimate origin. They couldn't tell whether the programmer had red hair or blonde hair or something. They couldn't even tell the program was a human. But what they could tell is that the programmer had intention or something had intention that started um, that started everything, um, started the process of, of moving. So when yeah. I talked about yeah, multiverses, just, just to go back to multiverses, Sorry. yeah. I said that multiverses, either they are continually moving and then they are themselves stuck in an infinite regress of causes, which which can't be the case if we because it has to has to start somewhere. Um, otherwise, an infinite regress is, is, is a self-contradiction, um, a, a, a beginning with no beginning, an end with no end. Um, or either it's static, but if it's static, it won't do anything uh, because static doesn't move or doesn't do. So the only th- the only conclusion left, the only possibility left after we've eliminated the contradictions is that this first cause um, initiates without prior and um, prior cause to itself or prior cause that compels it to create the first extension space, the first whatever you want to call it. And if it initiates it and it doesn't have to, then this is the definition of choice. It is um, making an uncompelled preference to something that it doesn't have to do. It's not compelled to do. So what what are the way possibly around that? I'd like to hear from you. Please tell me what other possibility is there if we avoid all contradictions. I, I'm really open open ears to you. I really want to want to know from you uh, that what is the, what other possibilities could there be? So first of all, the, the same objection that you launch every single time is this leads to an infinite regress, and infinite regress isn't possible, which isn't something that I accept. Um, and by the way, is contentious. It's not like it's. Uh, n- not a hot button issue to discuss whether or not an infinite regress is possible or to what extent. But the reason I use Conway's game of life is because it follows incredibly simple, rigid rules that it had no decision in making. There's no decision making process, there's no choice. And yet it creates things that, from their perspective, would have to look back and say, hey, what's the explanation for why I'm here? Well, there's a generator. Well, your your position here is that oh well, they can infer that there must have been a generator before that but from their perspective from their their standpoint from what they can and can't investigate they cannot do that it is only you from the privileged standpoint of viewing the entire system from the outside and understanding that it's a program can even infer that there was a program there because what the purpose of this program is supposed to do is show that simplistic rules things like physical rules about which chemicals can combine and in what ways can lead to complex um, machines without an intent to create that. that. That we are all, as far as we can tell, following the physical laws of the universe. We are chemicals, we are patterns of chemicals, we are patterns of, of physical objects that are following the rules that are in place that can lead to us. To suggest that, um, hey, I've taken a look at what could possibly be an explanation for the universe, and I'm just going to say that, well, you can call it God, you can call it multiverse, you can call it whatever you want, but it must be this, 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 and this. Um, I, I get that we can make some speculative assessments of what may or may not qualify, but this isn't something that we can actually investigate and produce evidence for. It is nothing more than we're going to sit around and think about this, given the limited information we have. And in the past, we would have come up with different and did come up with different uh, explanations. And maybe in the future, with better understanding of things, we might come up with other explanations. But to say that this is why in my opening, I talked about we can't just go with, well, this is... Uh, the conclusion I've reached given the current best evidence because the current best evidence once upon a time direct directly supported and almost undeniably so that the sun was going around the earth when that's absolutely not the case. And so the time for me to be convinced that there's sufficient evidence, that there's good evidence to conclude that there's a God is after that's the case. And not just because, well, I can't imagine that there could be an infinite regress and I don't know how a multiverse could work And if you're willing to say that the multiverse is God, except that it lacks intention, the purpose of Conway's game of life is to show that there is no intention there, despite what it, for for lack of a better word, creates. 
Okay, I, I think maybe perhaps you're misunderstanding what I'm saying or um, not, not seeing it. I, I didn't mention anything about simple rules becoming complex. I didn't talk about that at all whatsoever. I actually personally believe that simple rules do become complex. This has got nothing to do with my point at all. I'm talking about where do the simple rules themselves come from? The simple rules, where do they come from? Because if you have a first cause, um, a first determiner, should we say, and the, the first cause, there's nothing prior to it. So if it, if it builds an object, makes an object, let's say a certain size, let's say 10 meters of space time, it creates, um, it could have made it 15 meters of space time. It could have made it 20 meters of space time. So if it makes, if it's, if it select out of the infinite possibilities, it selects one particular possibility, has a preference for one particular possibility, even though it could have made infinite possibilities and it's not compelled to make any particular one or make any of them at all whatsoever, then this is the only can only be explained by choice because choice is the explanation of why there exists preference when something um unintentional can't generate preference can't so, generate so this preference is... even, even create, or if i if i might finish um you said that what I, how i'm arguing is that based on the current best evidence uh, no i'm not i'm arguing on the fundamental observational reality itself i'm not arguing about any particular type of quark I'm not arguing any about a particular type of um, Hilbert space. I'm not arguing about any particular thing except the very existence of extension itself and change. These are the most fundamental observations of reality. And I argued from that, that those two observations, if you want to avoid infinite regress, it, it is that you have to conclude with a beginner and a sustainer. Now, you said I can't imagine infinite regress. That's not my contention against infinite regress. My contention against infinite regress is merely to posit that infinite regress is a self-contradiction. Infinity is not exhaustible, yet to get from the past, an infinite past to now, you'd have to exhaust an infinite amount of time moments to get to this point. So it, 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 the inexhaustible becomes exhausted. That's a contradiction. That's why infinite regress is impossible, because of contradiction. Unless we throw the laws of logic out, out of the out of the window and so on, unless you're willing to do that. Is it, are you willing to do that? Um, so actually the rules of logic have nothing at all to say about infinite regress. You have to construct an actual argument uh, to get there. But the thing I'm pointing out with Conway's game of life, because you're concerned about where did those rules come from? Well, the purpose of this analogy, the rules were simple. Any live cell with fewer than two living neighbors dies. And that's to represent overpopulation. It's not a rule that needed to be created that over or sorry, underpopulation, that underpopulation leads to death. This is what the physical facts of the universe dictate. Okay. So it, to suggest that the physical facts of the universe had to be a certain way uh, or, or, or could have been created in a certain way or need an explanation rather than that they just are true is something that you would actually have to demonstrate. And when you say that choice is the only explanation, there's no choice involved in this. Just like there's no reason to think there's any choice involved in the notion that without enough oxygen, I die. That if you remove my head, I die. That if everybody around me dies, my chances of dying increase dramatically because of the physical <laughs> rules of the universe. To say, well, where did those rules come from is something you have to demonstrate that there was in fact some other alternative um, that was possible. And if you just get to the choice of the only explanation, when you say, by the way, in your, in your side, that you're not arguing about quarks, I, I would say that in my first re rebuttal remarks, I mentioned uh, or, or had notes about quarks, because when you say that everything that extends into space uh, cannot be divided, well, how do you know that? Because isn't there going to be some smallest particle that can't be divided? Oh, um, well, you mean divided by what, right? So divided by us, then probably no. But if, if it can be conceivably divided because it has extension, it, it's, it's a form. It's a form of something, right? Like uh, if I make it's a form of something, but you can't say it's a form of nothing, right? It's a form of something. But then if that's a form of something and I can then cut it in half to two parts, then the question is, does that part depend on the other part? Right? If they both depend on each other, that's circular. That means that, that nothing would exist. It's like saying that uh, a poor person depends on money for another poor person. Another poor person depends on the money on, on, on his mate. And they don't, they don't have money. Whereas ultimately speaking, there has to be something behind substance, you could say, 
uh, that isn't um, extended in space that sustains substance because if not, then what is everything made out of? You can't have a universe of just forms that can be divided infinitely into more and more forms and there's no substance. Dare I say, your worldview lacks substance, uh, unfortunately. Um, my, my worldview is predicated entirely on substance and yours is predicated entirely on a, a suspected extra substance, super substance, foundation substance. When I talk about... You, you say that everything that extends into space. Uh, you don't is, believe in uh, the foundation substance. If, if you, when I say that, when you tell you everything that that extends into space can't be divided or can be divided, and I ask whether or not a quark can, I don't know whether or not a quark can, but whether or not a there's a smallest product particle. Uh, for you to suggest that if you can conceivably divide it, like you could talk about, hey, here's a quarter of a quark, an eighth of a quark, a sixteenth of a quark, that if you can conceivably divide it then that qualifies. Well, I could think of there's half a God, a quarter of a God, as long as we're just engaging in this speculative oh. thing. But if in okay. fact, but if in fact, there are things in the universe that can't be divided, then your assertion at the beginning that there aren't anything in the universe that can't be divided is wrong. That was the only point I made. Okay, so um, you said you can conceive of a quarter of a God, but if God doesn't depend on spatial extension, how can you divide something into a half that doesn't have extent or, or, or size, doesn't depend on size or extension in the first place? Well, you can't if, divide. If a quark dis if can't divide quark depends a quark. on space and has a limit to how much it can and can't be divided physically in space, and all you're going to do is say that you could conceivably divide it, you could say that for anything. To no, argue that uh, you couldn't actually do it with God is not to say that you couldn't conceive of doing it, it's to say that you couldn't actually do it. And I'm saying you don't know that you can actually do it with a quark. Um, well, let's rewind it. What makes something divisible in the first place? What makes something... Mathematically speaking. Mathematically speaking. I'm not concerned anything? about mathematically speaking because that's conceptual. I'm talking about the physical world. Yeah. Um, but, but the point is this, that if it can be divided up into, into a left part and a right part, is the left part of the quark, diff quark different from the right part of the quark if it has, if they ha has extension? Yeah, and if they are if they're different from each other, then the quark can be divided. But if they're then the same, then the quark doesn't have a left and a right side. Um, that then it's it's not really in in extension. But if it's not in extension, doesn't it doesn't have extension? How does it exist in space? Because space is extension. So something that doesn't have extension doesn't occupy any space in space to even be part of the space itself in the first place, outside of space. Um, and that's my point: is that God doesn't occupy space, uh, doesn't depend on space, and doesn't occupy space in this universe, and therefore, by definition, um, is not, uh, well, the, 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 I suppose you can call it the Pauli exclusion principle that, that illustrates this to some extent, but it, it, then it's outside of space, uh, time and, and it's the only conclusion to the fact that uh, when it's, it's, not, not, it's indivisible, right? So if something is conceptually divisible uh, it, and occupies space, then the problem is it can always be infinitely divisible uh, and the question is, at what point in its infinite divisions is there something actually there? It's not, not, not just a form of something else. Forms don't exist by themselves. Forms are made of material or substance. To, to Forms actually don't even exist in, in a way, if you want to be a meriological nihilist. Yeah, right, right. So then what's at the bottom of, um, of like, like the, the, the problem, and here's my argument, just to restate it. Um, if the universe is made up of non-extended pieces pieces that have no extension if you add them all together you don't produce extension because zero plus zero plus zero size doesn't equal any type of size but the 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 problem is that the universe has extension and so where does that come from so the only conclusion because anything that has extension can be further divided up so the only con the only possibility left is that the universe of extension of extended space is being sustained by the part of the universe, quote unquote, as in the part of existence that doesn't have extension and it extends it, it by sustaining, meaning it extends reality into existence. That was the only possibility left, because either you say that the universe is just made of infinite, uh, infinitely divisible, um, smaller and smaller forms and no substance, because that's what that's what you'd be saying if you say there are no, it is infinitely divisible or um, both theoretically or what have you. Um, or it's made up of um, uh, points, point particles, or whatever you want to call it, like things that have no extension. But if you add them all together, space, if space is made up of just infinite, infinitesimal points, you can't produce extension in the first place. And that's the problem. That's the fundamental problem that Zeno uh, of the Eleatic School uh, noticed. 
uh, and his his solution was to say that in a way the uh, uh, observable reality is an illusion <laughs> uh, and deny his senses because they couldn't explain it whereas i can simply say there is an explanation that is that is the only possible one that's left which is that extension is only possible because um, the part of existence that is not extended in space and indivisible sustains the part of the of, the, of existence that is extendable and so on and so forth. And so court of God doesn't make any, um, wouldn't make any any um, sense. Um, by the way, I had a question I did want to ask you, which is how do you define supernatural? Use that word. Um, how do you define it? Supernatural is the label that I tend to use and that other people tend to use for the proposed things that are not contained and constrained by the natural world. Um, what's, the, what's the natural world? Um, please define natural world the observable physical universe governed by um well physics so is what you is the non-observable part of the universe the unnatural world or supernatural what unobservable part of the universe well are you saying that what well, all we observe of the universe is all there is no i'm saying so well see there we we can so like there's a planet somewhere that we haven't observed. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Is that what you're getting to? Um, yeah, or just, um, you know, there could be multiple bubble universes, which will be part of the, the whole universe. In, in that's time. not that part. Was... So, so when we talk, that's, this is the problem is that we, we misappropriately named uh, universe as one verse. And this is why like Sagan and others refer to cosmos as everything there ever is and was. And then universe is our name for our local presentation of the universe, which is how, because it, it doesn't even make sense to say there's a multiverse if you have a universe, because universe suggests that there's one. Um, but for me, when going back to what you were saying about Zeno's paradox, um, the strength of Zeno's paradox is to show that the fact that we can conceive of something doesn't mean that it's actually possible in reality. Um, that in order for the arrow to get from here to the target, it must cross half that distance. And before it can cross half that distance, it must cross half of that, with half of that and half of that and half of that. And to show that you can infinitely divide the distance to suggest that the, the arrow can never get started when we already know conclusively that the arrow can get started and the arrow can reach its target is to kind of show that just because you can conceive of something or inversely because you can't conceive of something doesn't tell you whether or not it's actually real. And so... Well, do you know what Zeno was trying to do? Talk about when, you, when you talk about God being outside of space... God then you're saying doesn't extend into space time, correct? So when I talk about so repeat that last bit again, sorry. So God then doesn't extend into space time. Um, well, we'd say that uh, God God must exude something that basically extends extends space time itself, create something by so we we can call it exertion of power. Yeah, that's um, that's not the question I asked. I, I didn't say, do you believe that God is a foundation? that creates and sustains and extends space-time. I, I asked whether or not God exists within space-time. Well, it, so God doesn't occupy um, space and time in our universe. And so, so by this, yeah, because because he's, because God would have to be, doesn't depend on extension, uh, nor does depend on change. So if we made a, a set of all the things that are not uh, existing within our local presentation of space-time, God would be on that list. That is outside the observable, um, observable universe. Then yes, which but that links back to supernatural, though, because you know the quantum world wasn't known by scientists prior to the nineteenth century. So would the quantum world be supernatural until humans discovered it? Let's say because it was at one point outside of the observable universe. So is is quantum is the quantum world supernatural before humans? um in, in, uh, experimentally detected it no but it would the notion of the thing the things that that we've found with within the quantum world wow okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna have to rephrase this because knowing that um dr strange and the multiverse of madness is coming and and there's a different marvel cinematic universe quantum world i don't, I don't want to confuse anybody so when we talk about this has come up many times let me see if i can address this real quick Let's say there's something that is proposed to exist and it doesn't seem to be part of the natural world. And so we write it off as supernatural or we consider it supernatural. 
if we later find out what it is and that it is in fact part of the natural world, then it was always part of the natural world. It's just that we didn't know that it was part of the natural world. So for me, when, when you talk about something supernatural, when you talk about something that by definition would be supernatural, something that exists uh, and is not bound by space time and, and laws of physics, and uh, it, that doesn't just apply to like a multiverse or a, a different universe. Like the, you know, here's, here's our universe and a separate universe. The separate universe isn't necessarily uh, supernatural. Supernatural in, includes this notion of, 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 existing in some way within our universe in some detectable way. Like we, we use that for like ghosts because people will claim they've seen ghosts. Um, and it goes beyond what we understand of the natural uh, laws of the universe. I have no reason sure. to think anybody's ever actually seen a ghost. I'm happy to believe that they think they've seen something, but them seeing something isn't enough. Define to... universe. Sorry. Define what? universe. Use the word universe. So, so, the, the, so define. I did universe. that a little bit ago, where the cosmos is everything that exists, and the universe is our local presentation of the universe. But then, as I said, if if God exists or, or be outside of space and time, it would, uh, by that definition, would be in the universe, would be part of the universe. What would if it? No, if it's outside of our local space and time, it's by definition not a part of our universe. Our universe is our local <laughs> presentation of the universe. Our universe is, is local presentation of the universe, space-time. If you say that something is outside of that, then it's not a part of this universe. The universe is our local presentation of the universe. That So isn't that contradictory? You're saying that the universe is, is oh only... Oh, my God. I, I explained this like four times if we're just going to nitpick. Cosmos mm -hmm. is the word that I'm using on, on, by, via Carl Sagan for everything that's ever existed, et cetera. Universe is the word that we tend to use for our local presentation of a universe, the one that we are in. Okay, so then if that's the case, then supernatural is, is defined as what then, going back to that? So how would you then you'd say that anything that's outside of our local universe is supernatural? No, no. So supernatural applies to something that violates the laws of our universe, something that is detectable in our universe, but is not contained within it, I would say. So like somebody wants to say that there's a God that can manifest in a detectable way in the universe, but isn't bound by our universe. And they want to say that ghosts aren't uh, bound by our, the physical laws here. But is that making sense to you now? But if, if you can detect something in the universe, then by definition, wouldn't it be in some way existing in the universe? No, no, no. Because a ghost would have to interact with space and time. The fact that something can interact with space and time doesn't mean it's, it exists within space and time and is constrained by space and time. That's the whole thing behind most of the, uh, the God concepts is that God isn't in any way bound to our space and time, but God can do things within space and time that people then detect. That's the claim. Um, I'll, it's I'll just like space it's, and time it's, itself. It's just, it's just as if I created a Sims simulation I don't exist within the simulation. I am not in any way bound by the simulation, but as the uh, author of it and the creator of it, I can change things within it. And I can do so in a way that the individuals in there, to whatever extent there would be individuals, could potentially detect me. As a matter of fact, I would say that most of the God believers are running around claiming to be God detectors. Okay, no, that's good. Because I think it's very important we get our definitions um, sorted before um, mentioning um, certain terms. Um, but just to go back to what you said about Zeno, so you said that uh, Zeno demonstrated that just because we conceive of something doesn't mean that these things um, exist. That's true, but I don't think you are, you don't maybe, maybe realize the lesson that Zeno was was conveying to us, which is Zeno, Zeno assumed the universe was continuous, so that universe was infinitely divisible. It could be infinitely div divided. Um, Rather, what it shows is that the, the only possibility is, is, is now, because we have movement, we have change, we have um, extension, is that the universe is actually ex um, discrete. It has pixels, could you say, and you have things moving from one pixel, um, stop ceasing to exist in one pixel and appearing in another pixel, which is, in essence, movement. Uh, that's the only way to explain the paradox. But that's a, gr a further great example to show the universe is insufficient uh, the let's say the material universe or the observable universe is insufficient because what can cause something to cease to exist 
at one pixel and reappear it at another pixel unless it is something that is sustaining the universe. Like a, a processor is the one that does it with, with actual computer programs. It, it removes a dot from one pixel and it puts in a different pixel. Um, so without God, movement itself is not possible you know, because, it, to, to, because either things exist continuously and then therefore Zeno's paradox would apply that you, you have to cross an infinite amount of points to get to any point, which is not possible, or uh, the universe is discrete but how do you explain some, something ceasing to exist at one point and reappearing to exist at another point um, without some, some ex external agent moving things around? I might have missed oh. it. What's the example of something that ceased to exist at one point and begins to exist at another new point? Uh, the, the pixels on your very computer. So that the, in order, in order the to pixels move... pixels on my in, computer in, don't cease to exist. Or should we say uh, the, the the color or the light that's that is switched on on, on the particular pixels? Um, the pixel the, itself, the, it, the yeah. pixel itself is changing state from lit or not lit. It's not ceasing to exist. There's nothing that ceased to exist. It just changed changed state. What's what's an example well, of something that ceased to exist at one point and began to exist at another one? Well, I'm actually using the example of I'm actually using that as an example to look at reality itself. So obviously, we know that. Um, things don't, uh, at least in in in, a, in a, on the computer screen, they don't. Things don't cease to exist or, or stop existing and then begin to exist. But rather, what we we do have is that a state is changed um, on the computer screen by the processor or graphics card, and then it it, it changes it elsewhere on, on a separate disconnected um, part of the of the computer screen, and that's what we call movement. And so, what Zeno, in essence, inadvertently demonstrated is that. The universe actually, in order to have movement, it must be divided into discrete parts. And to have anything moving within these discrete parts from one part of it to another part of it must involve at some point something ceasing to exist um, or at one part or and reappearing at another part or the, the state change of, of one particular part of the universe and then a, a different state change, a different part of it. Something is connecting these parts together to enable the movement of things in this universe. And that itself is another argument uh, not an evidence you could say that um, the universe requires something outside itself, a processor, a pro, uh, um, to to move things in this universe. Otherwise, uh, what is actually? How do you explain movement in the first place? Uh, that's that's no. I didn't really come in with that particular argument today. That's a that's an additional argument, but it's just something that I found was um, uh, I found was quite interesting. So, um, but this, this, yeah. well, hang on, you asked me. How can I explain something ceasing to exist and beginning to exist again? And then we, yeah. when we run through it all, it turns out you're not talking about anything that ceased to exist and began to exist. You haven't given an example of something that ceased to exist and began to exist. So all you're suggesting is that there must be a sustainer. Otherwise, how can you explain movement at all? And to whatever extent that there must be some explanation for permissible movement, I don't see how it gets to the thing that you're trying to define as a god, uh, but when okay, you no, ask I me to say, explain how, how something, do you explain movement? When, how do you explain you ex movement? You, a you ask me to explain how something ceases to exist and begins to exist again, and I have no example of that, and you can't provide one. Okay, um, actually, what I'm really asking you is how do you explain movement itself? I don't. I don't know enough to explain movement. But the fact that I don't have an explanation for movement, other than it seems to happen all the time, um, it's, it, it, and that change is the one constant, it doesn't tell us anything at all about whether or not there's a God. I, I'm not a physicist. Well, well I'm not said, an expert in temporal mechanics. I'm not an expert in causation or movement. Um, but I can tell you that, um, you know, your notion that the only explanation is that there must be a sustainer and that this sustainer carries these particular characteristics, I, uh, I just don't see that you've made the case that the thing that the thing that is the best explanation for why there can be movement is a necessary uh, external, independent, powerful uh, agent who can, who through their will chooses to allow movement or make movement possible. Um, the notion the the Zeno's paradox with the arrow is defeated because the arrow has length. The, the notion that you, you'd have to walk half the distance, half the distance, half the distance, half the distance, ignores the fact that my first step covers way more than half of, you know, the distance, especially on, on an infinite regress that way. And so 
when we see this, I, I think that when you're sitting here saying, what is the explanation for why is there movement? Uh, I have, I don't even know that we've defined the term well enough to say that we could have an explanation, but I don't know how you conclude that the only or best explanation is that there's a being for whom we don't have any direct evidence for who exists outside of space time. Uh, our local you, presentation is space time. Would you like um, to hear the, how it's, how it is necessary, necessitated, necessitated, sorry. Would you like to hear how it's necessitated? Because we got about five movement minutes is left, what? just to let you guys know. That's fine. So a movement is basically displacement from one position to another position. So there are two ways except to get that, from Except one. that we're not necessarily talking about discrete positions. Oh, I didn't say that. I was actually about to go into the two possibilities. Either between any two points, there is an infinite number of continuous points between any two points, um, or there's a finite number of, of extended blocks or let's say lengths, which are um, discrete. So let's go with the first option, see where that takes us. The, the first option is that between any two points, there's an infinite amount of points, and then Zeno's paradox would apply, which is to get from A to B, you'd have to cross an infinite number of points, which um, infinity doesn't exhaust, doesn't end. And so therefore you have to cross an unending amount of points. Uh, you have to end an unending amount of points to get to your, your destination, which is the problem which Zeno's paradox highlighted. That then leaves the only other possibility, which is that between any two points, there's a finite amount of extended um, uh, ex extensions in space, which are basically of con uh, discrete, or let's say, you know, uh, pixels, if you'd like to, to, to use that term. And then the question is, of course, um, okay, but then how does something get from one pixel to the, another, to the other pixel? Because it can't just walk over to the next pixel because there's an infinite amount of points between any two pixels. And so it would have to be, well, you have to cease, cease existing on this pixel and, and start appearing in the other pixel is the only explanation, but then where does it go? Right. So if it maybe maybe you could say maybe it, it goes there's a special, let's say, loop or tube that connects each pixel together between these two pixels and say oh, that's great. But then how does it move in in the tube? Does the tube have an infinite number of points to get it from one to, uh, from one part of the tube to the other part of the tube? And then and, and the problem just goes on and on forever, whereas th there is there is an explanation that's left after you discount all these contradictions. The only explanation is that, well something that exists at one point in universe and then suddenly exists in the next instant of time in Planck time, maybe let's say in the next instant is because it was um, it was removed from one position and replaced in a different position by the very thing that sustains the entire universe, uh, which would be external to the universe because the universe itself is not is not sufficient by this demonstration. It just simply shows the universe is not sufficient to to produce movement is my argument. Because okay. if you say it does, it produces contradictions, um, unavoidable contradictions. It, it doesn't actually, because I, I'm not aware of anything that is a space point. What size is a space pixel? Maybe Planck length, who knows, it, or, or, or smaller. Well, I mean, you've come up with Planck time as a potential thing, but how small is small? How do you know that there is a point at all? Because it seems to me that when you talk about something moving from one point to another, yes, at T0, we can say that it is here, although our assessment of its location is at best of an approximation. And at T1, it is in some other position. But to whatever degree we're able to narrow that down for our investigation, it exists at every single one of those points and at every single one of those times. There's be a one-to-one -one match. So this notion that you can come up with an analogy that there's space pixels and that therefore that means something disappeared from this pixel and moved to this one, it just means you've come up with a bad analogy. Well, well, no, because your argument would only be valid if all these pixels were independent of each other and disconnected and and in their own separate universes. But there is actually movement between these oh. pixels. There's, a, there's, there's connection between them. And if there is so, then the issue is how are they connected if there could be, if there are, by extension, infinite number of points between any two points in extension? So first of all, so, when you say my argument would only be valid, I think you mean sound. Um, but if if pixels were independent and disconnected, but that's what well, uh, that's what oh, you're valid and sound. I meant that's what you okay. Valid, valid there, are two, there are two different things. One goes to structure. One goes to content. Uh, you know, if, if if you're saying valid and sound, you just all you need to do is say valid. So you know, I'll, I'll leave it to somebody else. 
to come up to show how the structure of the response that I made was invalid and fallacious rather than merely unsound. But when you'd say that the pixels aren't connected together um, or aren't discrete, you know, I'm, I'm, that, that is the I'm, analogy. That is the analogy that you made, that there are discrete points that it's moving to. And I don't accept that that is an actual accurate description of space time. We've got to move into well, you're, you're, shortly here. Yeah, you're, you're, free to, you're free to accept that. But um, that, that, even though that's currently the best theory, theory of physics, uh, physicists, I'm not really going to argue just on the basis of physicists. You, wait, you're that, saying the best current model of physicist is that there are space wait, points, well, discrete you, pixels? No, no. Uh, well, yeah, Planck length, Planck lengths, and Planck time, um, because the the, the that's um, that's the, the current the smallest the, that we can assess. That doesn't mean that it, the space uh, produced, is made up of pixels. Produced produced by um, by the, the the equations of quantum mechanics um, on, on and the constants, but that's not even my argument. I don't. I'm not, my argument is not that the physicists believe it. My my simple point is that it's the only possibility that can resolve or prevent contradictions, um, but. The, the real argument I've been making all along, actually, is again, the past can't be infinite. We can't have infinite in the infinity in the past. And if even if you were to say, even if you were to say that the universe is uh, divisible up to a certain point and no longer divisible any further, uh, because we can't div divide it, the issue is this: anything that is divisible, anything sorry that has length or let's say size of any kind, is always a form of something. It's a size of something, right? The uh, a square doesn't exist. It's really just produced by the thing inside the square ending at those sides and making it into a square. But the square, the the boundaries of the square don't actually exist. So if you're saying that the smallest thing in the universe has a shape, oh, great, no problem. But here's the problem. Shape of what? Form of what? A universe that only has forms has no substance. And as long as we, we um, you argue that the, all that exists could only be things that only have um, size or shape or extension, then you have then you you there's a you have an inability to explain substance um, where does substance come into it where does substance come from there has to be a first subsister that um, sustains the first unit of fundamental substance and then uh, upon which extension depends otherwise you can't you, you there is no other possibility to you explain it. it other than con that produces contradictions I, I can give you about about a minute or so Matt, if you would like to have the last word before we go into the q a we've got a little bit left but then we have to go into the q a pretty quick it, it seems that the criticism is that i'm unable to offer an explanation for substance and he thinks he can so cool let's go on We'll jump right into the Q&A. One remind you folks, our guests are linked in the description. So if you'd like to hear more from our guests, you certainly can by clicking on their links below. And that includes at the podcast as we upload every debate to the podcast within 24 hours of the debate happening with the guest links in the description there as well. So thanks so much for your questions. This first one coming in from, do appreciate it, Apostate Prophet says, Abdullah, if God punishes me for not believing in him, doesn't that mean he punishes me for being flawed, i.e. stupid, which ultimately must be his doing, given that he created me? Also, will you debate me on Islam? Thank you. Okay, so to answer the first part of the question, um, humans are not fully rational creatures. Uh, we have many reasons why we do and choose things. Um, I, ideally, we, I wish we were, uh, that we all only made decisions which were based on evidence and had um, appropriate cause to do so. So you have people who are flat earthers, and as we know, they'll deny um, the most clearest evidence is that the earth isn't flat um, for reasons best known to them. My, it's not my job to uh, make people sincere, and it's not, it's not to God's job to make people sincere if they are insincere to the truth because it doesn't accord to their personal tastes and preferences. It's not a matter of being intelligent or not. It's simply about being sincere. And we don't believe um, from the Islamic perspective anyway. If someone is truly um, uh, is, is, uh, is sincere, but they remain, they don't have the full access to the, to the truth, then they're not going to be judged for things that they were unaware of or they were ignorant of sincerely, despite their best efforts to attain that truth. So that really doesn't apply to um, our particular worldview. And um, yeah, that, that's it really. And I, like if, if you, I don't, I don't, the rest basically the only substantial point he's, he's made. So I'll, I'll, that's my, my response to it. Um, uh, but also just to kind of put in there another, another point, which is um, some, just, I suppose there's an implication. To, directly yeah. to the question, I, I have yeah, to push us yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's also an implication there, which is that 
there's that those are people are punished who don't worship or believe in the specific god of islam and not other gods and this was obviously something that mentioned by matt earlier on um basically anyone who believes in an independent and uh, necessary being that is one and is upon which all the of the, the, the entire quote unquote universe depends upon um and has will believes the same god we do that's there's only one god there's only uh, despite the fact that people might have different ideas about what God might say, but just as the same point that people used to believe that the sun um, used to be a disc, uh, others believed it was a sphere, some believed it was an upturned bowl of fire, others believed it was a hole in space, and behind that um, there was a, a bigger sphere around around the, the solar system that was just made of fire, so the sun was just a hole in space. Different theories about the sun didn't negate the existence of the sun. Right. It just means that we didn't that there's different dispute as to what na its nature was or what have you. But there can only be, from our perspective, one God and anyone that believes in one God worships the same God that we do. There were also so, different theories. There were also different theories about phrenology and phrenology is bullshit. This one coming in from Why So Religious says, I heard Abdullah's argument, which has been around for centuries. Can you explain how this is evidence in particular? So um, I'm not sure I fully understand it. So you're saying that what the, the argument's been around for centuries, how is this evidence in particular? Well, the, the, the issue is this. Um, you, you can compel a human being to, to accept um, immediate evidence right in their face, as in if a train's coming to hit them, they for the most human beings would, and they, they're on the track and they see the train coming uh, and they have their faculties and they have their um, sanity with them. And then of course, they're, they're not gonna, few will dispute the, the train coming to hit them. But that the train came from a, a different de a destination, maybe it came from New York or it came from London. Uh, well, we know it comes from somewhere, but that's, of, that's subject to dispute because there are multiple possibilities of causes within the universe. But we're not talking about stuff that's within the universe. We're talking about what ultimately does the universe um, depend on. And on that, there isn't multiple possibilities that are devoid of contradiction. There's only one possibility that is not devoid of contradiction. All the other possibilities that the universe is eternal in the past and it's just been infinite regress, the universe uh, made itself um, and so on and so forth. These things, or the universe uh, was made by nothing, uh, from nothing and by nothing. These things have contradictions. And so the only thing that's left is that there is a creator that made everything. That's, that's, that's the point. I can't force you, I can't compel you to believe that. But all I can do is I can say, I challenge you to give me an alternative explanation um, uh, that even to show me how an alternative explanation is even possible after I've negated it by the, the logic of the excluded middle uh, well, principles. Move forward. This one from Stupid Horror Energy says in phase transitions, physical quantities can become infinite at the critical point. Given that infinity can be predicted and it describes real things, doesn't it mean that infinity is real? Think that's okay, so um, I, I would assume so. So um, I think physicists uh, would give you the best answer to this, which is whenever infinity is predicted in their equations, this means that the equations are not precise enough to, to map reality. They call it a singularity, and they have to deal with it by renormalization, which is basically uh, fudging it to, to fit um, uh, a more, more finite predictable results. Did you know that a prediction of infinity is how we discovered quantum, um, uh, the quantum world in the first place, when it, it showed us that energy isn't continuous, but discrete. And if you use continuous energy as, a, as a, an assumption, it produces in a particular experiment, um, infinite amounts of ultraviolet radiation, which clearly doesn't, didn't occur in that experiment, but a finite amount of radiation came out and they realized that their equations were wrong. So, um, see me when, when um, uh, or see or speak to a physicist about uh, equations that predict infinity. I'm sure they'd explain it uh, better than you than I could. This one coming in from Gemul79 for you, Matt. Said, Matt mentioned testimony as bad evidence. Isn't standpoint epistemology just testimony evidence? Is standpoint epistemology a good base for an ideology? That's for me. I think so. Um, they just well, the comment that I made about testimony really doesn't come into it because that was made in my opening remark and uh, Abdullah didn't argue from testimony. Um, and I don't know enough about standpoint epistemology to address the rest of it. So I'll have to punt and maybe hit me up in an email and I can look into it some more. You got it. And Lellers, thanks for your question, said, Abdullah, how does your hypothesis hold up against the Gnostic idea of Yahweh as a, I don't know if I'm saying this word right, demiurge? 
Could the creator God not also have been created by an even higher being? How can we tell which is the case? Okay, so when I said that there's a, a first cause, I didn't say how far back this first cause um, created universe. I didn't say how old the universe was or the observed universe was. I don't need to explain the, the distance. I can only, I can simply put, I can simply show that we've arrived at this point in time. And so there was a beginning point. I don't know how long ago that beginning point was, but for it to be a beginning uh, or and a first to have a first cause in the first place to prevent infinite regress, it must be that the first cause, there is nothing prior to the first cause. And so I'm not saying what that was. So if you want to say that maybe the first cause uh, made something uh, which itself was a demiurge, and the demiurge made the universe, as some uh, Greeks um, philosophers um, uh, did believe, uh, then th th that demiurge wouldn't be God. It would be the first cause would be God. Um, that demiurge would just be an angel of some kind or an intermediary, if that would be the case. Of course, we'd say that the first cause can create things from nothing, so it doesn't need an intermediary. But um, so I don't really think... Um, it, it applies because the first cause by definition is first, otherwise we get an infinite regress, which is contradictory. And as I said before, the first cause or the necessary being that sustains all things, um, all matter, is the only possibility that is devoid of contradiction and therefore is the only possibility if you want to hold on to the rules of logic this and the uh, non-contradiction. This one coming in from Brandon Hansen says, James, you should hold donation streams or fundraisers to get John Lennox to debate on the channel. He's, in my opinion, one of the best debaters on the existence of the Christian God. I'd gladly donate this and more to see this happen. Thanks for letting us know that, Brandon. And it would be awesome to have Dr. Lennox on. Lenners, or Lellers says, also, hello, James. Awesome. You're awesome for starting this channel. Thank you. Thank you for your support. They said, I've learned so much about so many sides. Cheers, mate. Thanks for that, Lellers. And Issam Ulad Ali says, for Abdullah first, and then Matt, please respond, said, do you believe slavery under Islamic ruling to be moral? And would you be my slave under Islamic rules, Abdullah? And if no, why not? Um, I don't think it's relevant to, this, to the topic of the conversation. So um, I'm happy to have a debate on that, uh, on that topic itself, a different juncture, but I'm gonna restrict only to the topics that are relevant. Gotcha. Ozian says, Matt, is a theory of everything possible to investigate? Doesn't it have to just work and explain all observations? I don't think any theory of everything is possible to prove whether it be natural or not. I don't, I don't have an answer. I, I don't even know how the questioner has an answer. Um, the notion of a theory of everything is an, an, an interesting proposition that may be possible. I, I, I don't know that there's been a demonstration of possibility. So uh, I can't decide either way. And it's more interesting to me that the, the questioner did. You got it. And Cesar Roxy, thanks for your question, says, we can't have an infinite regress, both because we can't create an infinite through successive addition, and we can't traverse an actual infinite. I think that Matt, if you want to respond, I think they're trying to. I think the thing that the thing to remember is that infinity isn't a, quance, a, a quantity; it's a concept. There is no infinity. You couldn't talk to infinite people. That's a bit of hyperbole and misunderstanding about infinity. That human beings, it's an incredibly difficult concept to even begin to grasp, and most of us are bad at it. But when we talk about, oh, I did this infinite, you know, you could do this infinite times. No, you couldn't. By definition, you could not do something infinite times uh, because that would, that implies there's a quantity there. What it really means is without end, without beginning. It, it is a concept, not an actuality. Um, if, I might, if, I, if I might chime into that question, sorry. If I, if I might chime into that, that question. Um, um, I, I totally agree. agree with just because we have so well, many questions. That, that's fine. Just, uh, I really agree with what Matt said, which is why I want to ask him maybe uh, another point, um, why um, infinite regress can be a valid possibility other than a first cause, um, if he does believe that, that that to be the case. Surely then you'd agree with me that you can't have infinite regress in the past or an infinite regress of smaller and smaller things. There has to be a foundation to both the past and the uh, and extension itself in space rooted in something that is outside both time and space. Surely, would then you, you would agree with me if that's your your position on infinity and infinite regress. So the problem is, is that every time we're talking about time, we're talking about time within our local presentation of the universe, and I don't have a way to explore meta time.
Okay. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Gamol79 says, do arguments count as evidence? Um, I, I would say they, they have to, if and only if, um, all possibilities are, can be exhaustively presented by um, bivalent points, like it's something infinite or, or finite, it's something uh, dependent or infinite or the independent. And if you can negate all the po all the possibilities by the principle of contradiction, so you remove the ones which are which produce self contradiction, and you're left with only one answer, then that's when argument becomes definitive evidence. In fact, I would say that the argument that demonstrates God is the only possible um, explanation uh, um, behind the universe and everything that exists is actually the, one of the few arguments we can make with absolute certainty. All, all the arguments inside the universe are always going to be subject to Keep. uncertainty. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm simply saying that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, so, yeah. I'm just simply saying that. I think Matt makes the assumption that just because inside of extended space and time there are multiple processes that act as immediate causes, uh, he feels that that means that outside space universe must be the same. Whereas I'm saying no, outside the universe, or ultimately speaking, there has to be only one. There only has to be one uh, one cause in the law of non contradiction. Uh, yeah. Just because we have so many questions. So on, on the question questions. itself. No arguments aren't evidence. They're assessments of evidence. They're constructions. Uh, that take evidence and get to a conclusion. So they're not evidence, but they're the only way evidence winds up having value. This one coming in from Ghost. Thanks for your question. Says, can we just stop and appreciate the wondrous nature of a toad? Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Tremendous animals. Siraxi says, does Abdullah accept that the Kalam is a successful argument because Matt said the Kalam is dead? I'd say that the, uh, the the Kalam looks at a particular one particular aspect of, uh, of of reality, and so by itself is insufficient to um, demonstrate the existence of God. Um, it needs other parts um, added, other observations of the universe, and other further investigations uh, using bivalent principles, uh, looking at whether something is this or this, and then so it needs further stuff added to it in order to be a complete argument. You got it, and this one coming in from, do appreciate your question as well. Ozzy and Tox says, Abdullah, if we live in a simulation, then our beliefs are based upon that simulator, and we don't have access to knowledge beyond what the simulator allows, or in your case, Allah. So you can't prove Allah exists. Um, I don't really understand the the logic behind that, that argument. So by, by definition, even if we were inside a simulator, um, the question wouldn't be whether what we're seeing inside a simulation is true or not, because all, all things must come from somewhere. So even the simulation comes from somewhere, but would be sufficient to actually know that the, there is a creator. Like the example, the program that uh, Matt brought up, it, if you were inside that program somehow, you could conclude the existence of a programmer and a processor, both providing the beginning of the program and running it and continuing to run it and sustain it. Uh, so... In, inside a simulation or not, you'd still be able to prove there was an ultimate simulator, if you'd like, behind all things. Uh, just without trying to score a cheap point, would you like to correct the statement where you said all things must come from somewhere? Okay, so I say um, uh, all, all finite and limited things come from somewhere, okay. yes. This one coming in from Amy Newman says, I'll be running an open mic after show. Fantastic stream. Thanks so much, everybody. Said, Matt, I appreciate what you and the entire ACA does. And then said, question for Abdullah, what would change your mind that there is good evidence for God? Maybe like if Great. there's a defeater oh. or something. Oh, yes, yes. There's a falsification um, possible. So all, all, all Matt or anyone else would have to do is simply show that it, there is another possibility uh, other than God, to explain the universe, space and time, that doesn't suffer from contradictions. If you can do that, then that would be sufficient to destroy my arguments, um, because then there'd be more than one possibility. Yeah, the problem is, is that we don't have enough information, and we don't have the ability to investigate, to come up with a properly falsifiable proposition. And so the, what we're left doing is what I've done, which is to say, uh, I don't accept that you've ruled out the other possibilities or that we've even in, uh, make it, made an instantiated list of all the potential possibilities. It, the, the, the facts about what could explain why there's something rather than nothing, um, which could also just be nothing is impossible, uh, aren't the sort of thing that we can investigate. And so to say that the, thing, the one thing will change your mind is something that can't be produced. It reminds me of a time I was debating the resurrection 
and somebody said that they'd be convinced that Jesus wasn't re- as resurrected just as soon as we produced a body, um, which presumes all kinds of things right down to this person existed and that you could identify the body of somebody. I, Sorry, I shouldn't be even remotely saddling Abdul with that, but it's, it's, it's similar to say the thing that will change my mind is something that currently is impossible. This one coming in from Brandon Hansen says, Matt, the program may not have an intent to create anything within the program, but the person who created the program set up the rules and set in motion the program itself. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, In the sense that, yes, there was someone who created that program as an analogy for life, but the rules that they came up with were just about the physical rules of the universe. They were analogies to what makes something likely to procreate and continue its existence and pass on its genes, although this doesn't pass on genes, and what makes something likely to die. It's an incredibly simplistic thing that mirrors what can and apparently does happen within the universe without any authority or decision. You know, nobody had to pick what the gravitational constant was or, you know, we we are the species that evolved to fit the area that, permits our existence. It would be remarkable. It would be evidence for God if we were sitting here floating out in space, living our life in the absence, in in, in an area that's hostile and antithetical to our lives. Um, One second, sorry, if I might might chime in, sorry. Um, So the the problem, yeah, yeah, the issue with being in a program and seeing it has particular rules, and that might have come from previous simpler rules and simpler rules is, the rules were determined by something else and that was determined by something else and something else and something else and so the reason why i thought that program my analogy was a great argument for my position was simply that you can't have an infinite chain of determinism so certain rules are determined by other rules by other rules by other rules by other rules going back forever till now that would then we never get to now there has to be an ultimate determiner an ultimate programmer to start the the simple rules that end up in the more complex rules down the line so that's why i thought that example was a great point as an analogy to use for my own side, my own position. Except that that applies to prescriptive rules, not descriptive rules. The speed of light isn't something that you're going to get a ticket for. It describes how life works. And to propose that how life, how light works has an author is a claim that is extraordinary and needs actual evidence in support of it. This one coming in from the old descriptive rules must come from I just want to get okay. last word on that one just because it was a question for us. Sure. Old Two Eyes and sure. says, why... Given that the universe needs a cause, why doesn't God need a cause, Abdullah? Okay, well, there's two simple points for that. One is if the if the God was a a, a being that depended on extension, or depended on a prior uh, infinite number of moments of time, what have you in the past, then the issue would be that the Creator would be insufficient to explain itself, would require prior cause to Himself. But because the Creator doesn't um, doesn't ex- is not finite or limited, doesn't depend on 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 uh, substance for its extension because it's not extended it doesn't depend on extension in the first place it simply doesn't have the deficiencies that the two fundamental uh, forces or sorry fundamental observations in the universe does so uh, and of course the second reason why the creator doesn't have a, a creator of itself is because i'm i'm calling the creator the first cause there has to be a first cause to prevent an infinite regress and i'm going to say that whatever that first cause is and after I've demonstrated it has intentionality because it can't just initiate things for, um, for no reason at all. Um, if it is the first cause, nothing's making it do things that it does by choice. This I will call God. It's simply the answer to the 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 um, to an alternative to the infinite regress. That so hence by necessity it has to be the first cause. So I, I got it. let me jump in with this real quick uh, because this will serve as like a, a closing remark anyway because we only have a few minutes. Um, it's really interesting, and I don't think we spend enough. I don't think we spend any real time discussing this at all. But we talk about: Do we have good reasons to believe a particular proposition? Uh, you could easily convince me that there must be some sort of first cause, or that every infinite regress actually uh, is so problematic that there must be something. I just am not necessarily convinced of the details of it. And I certainly don't think that there's a justification to call it God. As a matter of fact, and no no offense to Abdullah, because I don't think he's doing that. I think he's being uh, reasonable and thoughtful. But I find that many believers are very happy to believe very specific things about a God and that God's character and devote their life to it and follow the proposed rules of this God. And then when arguing for it, 
uh, argue, well, there must have been a first cause and I'm just going to call it God. It's kind of like, here's a proposed explanation that isn't bound by space time yet can affect it, has existed eternally with no contradiction about infinite regress, can act without time and chooses without any antecedent positions. Its will, by the way, and choice is just so and not contingent or dependent upon anything, which means that this thing, if it is in fact an agent, is a non-rational agent. There can be no choice that it makes that is the result of rational consideration of effects because those things precede choice. It must be purely mechanical. And it seems that this proposed good reason is that without reaching this kind of conclusion, we might be stuck acknowledging that we currently don't have an explanation. But I don't find that a good reason. I'd rather keep looking for a better explanation. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Barry Barry says, seems possible to me that reality exists and movement is simply an inna in innate property of reality. I see no reason to accept a, quote, default state of reality in which there was no movement. This eliminates the necessity of a first cause or prime mover. Okay, so... Um, I'll kind of make this my also semi-final comment if because uh, I know there's, there's not much time left. So, uh, in essence, um, if what created this universe was mechanical, by mechanical it means automatic, uh, then it has something moving its internal components to make to make to do things. And then what? But what's making its internal components move? If you make even smaller components and even smaller or prior components and prior components and prior components, it would be an infinite regress, and and there's a problem. Likewise, if you say that, why, why does something static, uh, uh, we don't, I don't like the idea that something static then creates movement. So how about there was always movement in the past, as this question I was trying to intimate. Again, infinite regress. Any, where, any time we try to pick any other possibility other than something that is necessary or independent and initiates by choice and will, we end up inevitably with more contradictions. And it's not about... I say this because we lack information or it's God of the gaps. I'm simply saying that if we just use the laws of logic, we can eliminate every feasible possibility and even demonstrate that we've exhausted all the possibilities, almost like as a mathematical proof by exhaustion, uh, leaving only one. And that was the whole point of my argument was that I come to the, the attributes of God uh, being necessary, independent, and possessing will as the only solutions left that avoid contradiction um, to um, to explain movement, uh, change, spatial extension, and so on and so forth. You got it. With that, there are only questions left for you, Abdullah. And so one thing I just want to pitch by you guys is, Matt, I know that you've got to go, and we started a little bit later than expected. So I do want to let you go so you can get to your dinner plans. Also, Abdullah, if you're willing to field these last questions, these are more directed at you. So it, that way... Uh, they're not like addressing what Matt said in that way, you know, it's, you're it's just Matt engaging going. with the, the speak, the questioners, but oh, I know it's is also Matt going late. Uh, is, is Matt going now? Is that, um, that's correct. Uh, as I was yeah. going to ask if uh, you were willing to stay and field the final questions though, that were for you. Sure. Then, then before he goes, I just want to say to Matt, thank you very much for attending. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you too. Hopefully we can, maybe after getting some, some definitions down, we might be able to do this again in a, slightly different way or whatever else. A huge thank you to uh, James and, the, and everybody who showed up to participate in this and, and make it enjoyable. Uh, unfortunately, because we delayed it a week and then pushed it another week and a half, I actually have dinner plans. And so I had a, a hard set time, which we've just passed. So thanks everybody. Uh, to For all of the questions that Abdul is gonna address while I'm gone, I'd say uh, if they're about religion, we almost certainly disagree. And if they're not about religion, who the hell knows whether we disagree or not? But you got it. Thanks care, Matt, for being with us. I hope you have a good night. And then Abdullah, we don't have too many more questions. So I'm gonna fix the screen, folks. Give me a second as I tweak the pictures within OBS. And thanks, Abdullah, for staying with us extra. There the questions are they have many questions for you. And so I, I just want to entertain them. And stupid horror energy regarding your point that you had just brought up in the last question, you talked about an infinite regress. She said, you won't be able to get from a starting point T0 to now, but there is no T0 or T equals zero in infinity. There's no starting point, thus traversing a timeline from say 1960 to now is possible even in an infinity. Okay, well, uh, actually I think that further demonstrates the 
contradiction of infinite regress. So if you're saying that not only will we not um, in an infinite regress, there has to be, let's say, movement from one point to another, let's just say, or in a chain, any chain. So if, if she's saying that, um, well, forget about whether we'd arrive now after an infinite re regress of, of, of movement, but there'd actually be no beginning to it. And I say, well, exactly. Um, infinite regress is both is a contradiction in that there are beginnings, as in the present begins, but there's no beginning to the entire chain. And at the same time, also saying that we there's an ending. We reach this end, this the present after transversing infinity, but infinity can't be ended. So both ways you look at it, no beginning, no end, and yet we have beginnings and endings in in time is a further a further illustrates the fact that infinite regress is um, contradictory and therefore is, is not a description of reality. You got it. Before jumping to the next question, I do want to say we, it has been, we've been thankful to have both Matt and Abdullah on. They're linked in the description, folks, in case you forgot. That includes at the podcast. We put our guest links there. If you want to hear more or read more from either of our guests, you can by clicking on those links. And this next question coming in from Corey. Gorski says, Abdullah, if at some point science further explains the origin of the universe and it's still a naturalistic explanation, would that lower your confidence in God existing? Okay, so really, I mean, um, I used an analogy before, like science is basically uh, investigating something within our bubble of reality, but it can't penetrate beyond the bubble of reality that is is defined by things of extension and things of change. So no matter whatever we investigate to try to find, uh, we, we can only rewind the clock back on our models of how things work, the regularities between change or regularities of change, what we call the physical laws, are only as far back as the first moment, right? And it, and science will just simply say it was arbitrary, um, the, the rules are arbitrary. It doesn't go beyond that because science can only tell you how things transverse from one moment to the next under what kinds of regularities. We need to go beyond um, looking at physics to see, well, actually, where did the physics itself come from? Where did the actual uh, substance and where did even time itself come from? Uh, science will, or physics will never be able to tell us that. It can't go outside the goldfish bowl of reality that we are in. The, the goldfish bowl of, of movement and change and the goldfish bowl of, of um, things extended in space. We can't go beyond into non-extension and into um, no change. You got it. This one coming in from more of a theological question. This one is Mr. Monster saying, double return debut for Matt and James, and also first time appearance for Abdullah. Really fun one. Said, glad to have you here, and said, very insightful debate. And then they also, they raised this theological objection. They said, God cannot be all loving if God punishes skepticism with eternal hellfire, though, Abdullah. Okay, so that's um, a, few, a few assumptions in there. One, who says that God is all loving? All loving implies that he can only love, whereas that's not we, we describe God as the loving in the Quran. God is described as the loving or describes himself as the loving. So he can also be the, the punishing for those people who are insincere, who, are, who act with criminal intent, uh, who put their own desires above the creator of the universe and are, in, are ultimately insincere. And it's not skepticism because uh, skepticism can be for multiple reasons. It could be legitimate and it could also be illegitimate and humans are irrational so there's going to be a lot of illegitimate reasons uh why people engage in skepticism and those are the people that uh should at least should repraise their attitude to life and the truth itself uh, otherwise there can always be there will be consequences of being insincere and un ungrateful to the sustainer of your very existence you got it thank you very much ozzy and talk says how did god talk to humans or angels without there being time how could men go on journeys to heaven without time existing? And is heaven outside of time or is it eternal? Is and it's like, so we'll let you have a chance at those three questions before I go to the fourth one. Okay, so, um, well, um, heaven would undergo change. There would be, uh, there would be change moving forward. Um, but people think that just because something might persist, it somehow is infinite in, in, in forward time when, um, even at any one moment, if you would stop the proverbial clock in heaven, only a finite amount of time has ever passed in any moment you want to think about it in, in heaven itself. Or, or let's say um, in paradise, this would be a more specific term we'd use in the Quran. So uh, that doesn't, but that, there's no contradiction there because at any point in time, it's an ever increasing finite amount of time uh, in, in the hereafter. And so there's no problem, there's no inherent problem with that at all. You got it, and thank you very much. They also said, is time within 
or I, I should say, is heaven outside of time or is it eternal? Um, I think I already answered that, which is um, it's not outside of time, but it can still be eternal going forward because going forward, it's just ever increasing amounts of finite time. It, gotcha. it, it's not infinite, in, 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 infinite in, one, in, in one moment. Yeah. They said, is an infinite future possible? Oh, okay, I've already answered that. So it, it, I think the best way to put it is a, a persisting future, an eternally persisting future. But it's not that you have complete an infinity to get to the future at all. So that you just have an, a, an eternally increasing finite amount of, of, let's say, future of moments. That's all that. That's what will, what will be time in the, in the hereafter. You got a According to energy. mainstream. Yeah, a mainstream Islamic pers pers perspective anyway. You bet. And Sarah says the solution to Zeno's paradox is series one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth that converge into one. Well, uh, converge, but never reach. Um, the, the issue, the issue, what makes infinite regress the problem is not that you can imagine an infinite number of things in a set, right? That we can imagine an infinite number of things in a set. It's that there is a there's transversing between one point in the set. There's a connection between all the members of the set where you where you exhaust infinity to get from one member of the set to the other member of the set to add infinitum. That's the problem of infinite regress. It's not that I can imagine an infinite number of let's say disconnected bubble universes. They they all exist simultaneously. No problem with that uh, conceptually speaking. But to say that I um, if if someone was to be able to travel from one jump from one universe to the next and they would uh, and they would tell you that oh, yeah I've just completed an infinite amount of jumps that would be a problem because you can't exhaust infinity you can't complete infinity so I think I so I'm hearing some <laughs> sorry about that I'm actually traveling so I'm actually at the public library I will mute it next time they come on that caught me off guard Mr. Oh, T public library <laughs> that's right yeah no, no. <laughs> Mr. T said Matt says let's say oh, okay that's more Given that Matt's not here, I don't want to ask it because he's uh, not able to answer it. This one from Ozzy and Talk says, pixels don't move on the screen. They turn off a pixel and turn on a pixel one at a time within the hardware and how the hardware is arranged by software. You see it as moving. It's only an illusion, though. Um, my point exactly. That was what I was. Um, that was the point is that the, the pixels require something else in order to generate movement, which is a, a graphics card or the, or the processor, basically, that will switch off one pixel and turn on another pixel and make you think there's movement. So in a way, you could say that every new time segment that begins to exist, uh, and here's the point, it begins to exist, must have a cause. And so you could say that not only is there a first cause, but there is an ongoing cause to every new time segment, each new arrangement of the universe is being created um, from a prior, um, a prior point in fourth dimensional space, if you'd like to put it like there's, there's new, like in film, each film has to be has to be different from the film behind it. And so as if, so the question is, who's turning the reel to produce new slices of time and, and, and give us the perception of movement and change? It has to be something beyond time to do that, which is my point will be um, the creator of the universe. You got an apostate prophet said there is no concrete example of of as, it's just as sth that begins to exist all results from rearrangements can abdullah clearly demonstrate sth that quote began to exist from nothing unquote like god's mythical creation sorry um, is it sth we mean something I don't know what, what it means, it? though. It's not uh, capitalized either. I might come back to that apostate prophet. This one from Jesse White says, Abdullah, do you have a defeater for Hitchens Razor? If you're familiar with Hitchens Razor, if not, I can share what it was. Sure. Um, Illustrate for, for all of us. If I remember right, I think it was that if God is the foundation for ethics, then is there something that only, for example, a Muslim, if Allah is the foundation for ethics, what ethical behavior... Is it that only a, like that only a Muslim could do and that others could not do, which I think um, Hitchens assumed that in order for God to be the foundation for ethics, that would have to be the case, that there would be something that only Muslims could do that um, atheists, for example, could not do in terms of as a moral behavior. 
Oh, I, I, I think I remember. It was more, wasn't it more like uh, if something is posted without evidence, it can be dismissed without evidence. Is that not the case? Maybe well, that's what it's they been mean. Some it's been some time since I encountered um, uh, Hitchens' work, so uh, let's go with that one. That not... sounds like it's at least close to Occam. It's closer to Occam's razor. Let's go with that. Sure. Okay. Well, um, I, I would agree. Is that if something is is positive without evidence, it can be dismissed without evidence. Um, but if space and time, in this particular case, I'm advancing that they are definitive evidence using the rules of logic that point to only one possible um, explanation that is necessitated by um, by their existence, which is space and it, uh, space requires a sustainer and time requires a, a initiator. But you also you can also mean it you can also say it needs an advancer as well, one that advances each moment of time. So um, I've pointed out I haven't cited anywhere testimony. I haven't I, I only mentioned the chronic verses at the very end just to highlight that the argument I kind of get from the Quran, but the Quran is using an argument telling us to observe and come to our conclusions ourselves, not just take the Quran's word for it. So we're using evidence now. And now the question is, how is this evidence going to be engaged by those who may, might wish to maintain a uh, naturalistic worldview in spite of the insufficiency of, of, um, of their worldview to explain the observable? Gotcha. And I'll give you a chance to try to humor this person. They all too wise himself said, I'm still lost on how infinite space time or cosmos is so absurd while an infinite God is not that they asked that same question earlier. So I'm not sure how you want to address it. Okay. So I think maybe the guy's not responding to me per se, or maybe he misheard. So I, I didn't even mention that space time is infinite because we can't, we haven't seen infinite space time. Even if there was an infinite amount of space time, it, each segment of space time is divisible. You could cut, take a piece out and just, and it could be infinitely divided up into smaller and smaller pieces, um, not reaching any bottom, so to speak, or any substance to it. Whereas uh, the creator, we don't, when you say, we don't say the creator is infinite in extension. Uh, we simply say that the creator is indivisible and is the first cause. That's why I don't, I, if you want to say infinite in power, well, now I can justify that, right? Because if the creator can make something from nothing um, without prior cause or what have you, then the creator can add to existence, add to reality at will. And I use an analogy. Imagine there's somebody that can make gold coins appear in their hand, any, any amount they want, just by will. It doesn't cost them anything. It doesn't cost them any resources. They can just make any amount of gold coins appear in their hand. How rich are they? Well, you'd say potentially they're infinitely rich because they can do it as much as they want. Well, then God is inex has inexhaustible power. He can, if he can make one thing from nothing, he can make uh, billions of things from nothing. And so he is inexhaustible in power. And another way of saying that is infinite in power, but he's not infinite in extent. Uh, he doesn't depend on infinite extension because he doesn't depend on extension to exist. Gotcha. Next up, thank you very much for your question. This one, uh, Apostate Prophet said their question was meant to mean STH is something. So there is no concrete example of something that begins to exist. And then said, all results from rearrangements. Can Abdullah clearly demonstrate that something that, quote, began to exist from nothing, like God's m mythical creation? Okay, so that's exactly what I actually addressed in my opening presentation. I said that the first thing that exists can't be arrangement because arrangement. So let's say, um, what was the first cause? Is the first cause arrangement? You can't have an infinite, an infinite regress of causes going back. So there has to be a first cause. Is the first cause arrangement or is the first cause something indivisible um, that initiates um, extension in the first place? So I said, well, let, let's, let's humor if this, the first cause is itself arrangement. Uh, arrangement of what? Right? Uh, it would be whatever it was made out of is causing the first movement or the first. But but if whatever is made out of is made out of more more arrangements, then those things again will be made out of more arrangements and more arrangements and more arrangements or, or extensions, so to speak. And therefore, they can't be the first cause of anything. Uh, in a way, you could say a form doesn't move, but the things inside the form is the one that's doing the moving. So then the first mover or the first cause has to be something that precedes arrangement or extension. 
because anything that has extension doesn't move by itself. Moves, so the only thing that can begin the movement, you could say, or begin a change, um, is something that doesn't have extension. But then, if it where where would it move if it can't if it's not in extension, right? Where would it move? So the first thing that has to be done to make change is that change that um, extension must be created by an indivisible thing that itself is not an arrangement. So arrangement must be created by non-arrangement is the first thing that happens. And therefore that means that the first cause itself is not an arrangement, but is itself the cause of arrangements. It is, it is the arranger and not an arrangement itself. So that was my argument I presented in the, my presentation. And I think that addresses the question. You got it. And last one. Thanks for your patience. You've been uh, a good sport staying for us for these uh, extra questions. Why is a religious says, uh, Surah 2, 106 of the Quran says, if it was not from your Lord, you would find it much contradiction. Then says, if I bring one, you say that's not many. I bring 100, you say not many. They say this is moving the goalpost fallacy. We'll give you a chance to respond to that if you'd like. So um, one of the many beautiful things about the Quran is that it gives us a falsification test, which it says that if the Quran itself does not come from the creator, it would have contradictions in it. Because anything other than the truth is going to have contradictions, which is also the basis of my entire argument today, which is anything other than God as an explanation has contradictions behind um, regarding explaining the, the uh, space and time. So uh, regardless of, of, of one, the hundred, what have you, if you simply bring one contradiction uh, in a legitimate contradiction, and it again, has to be legitimate contradiction in the Quran, then that would invalidate it. That would be a falsification test. It would meet the falsification test of the Quran. So I don't need a hundred. You just bring me one le legitimate contradiction and that would be sufficient uh, to meet the falsification test. You got it. Thank you very much, Abdullah. And want to say, seriously, thanks so much for staying with us for extra time to answer those questions. We really do appreciate you spending your time with us. Folks, you can find both Abdullah and Matt's links in the description, as mentioned. And one last thank you to you, Abdullah. I will be back in just a moment, folks, where I will give updates on upcoming debates. But one last thank you, Abdullah, for real. It's been a true pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for inviting me, James. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. So I am going to just uh, break the chat here, and I'll be back in just a moment, folks. And so thanks so much, everybody. My dear friends, thrilled to have you here. And I want to say again, a huge thank you to both Matt and Abdullah. That was a fantastic debate. I told Abdullah, I was like, that was superb. Seriously, I am so excited about how well that went. And thank you guys for your support. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next time. And don't forget, if you'd like to see more content like this, please support the channel by subscribing and clicking the notification bell. If you find this video insightful and beneficial, please support the YouTube algorithm to spread it by liking, commenting, and sharing. Thank you.